Good evening, everyone. I'm so glad you've joined us. I am so excited about this conversation. For me to also not only be in conversation with these brilliant women who have done such important thinking um, about abolition, about transnational movement building, but also for the fact that this is a project that is supporting an organization that's very near and dear to my heart, People's Advocacy Institute. So first I wanna say a little bit about study and struggle before we get started and um, share a little bit about PAI. So um, the Study and Struggle Program is the first phase of an ongoing project to organize against incarceration and criminalization in Mississippi. And I am in Mississippi right now saying hello to you from Jackson. Um, through four months of political education and community building, um, the Critical Conversations web webinar series hosted by Haymarket Books will cover the themes for the upcoming month. So Haymarket Books is an independent, radical, nonprofit publisher that publishes some of my very favorite books. And I want to encourage you all to check out some of their offerings. It's very, very important work and a really important model. Um, while all of the study and struggle events are freely available, we ask that those who are able, and I know this is Giving Tuesday, um, to make a solidarity donation to support the important work of the People's Advocacy Institute as well. Um, just a little bit about People's Advocacy Institute for people who don't know, is that here in Mississippi, they really lead the abolitionist work and the abolitionist dreaming that we have here in Mississippi. And some people may know that it takes a lot to dream that way in Mississippi, but we also come from real good stock. Um, I'm sitting in front of a picture among other people of Fannie Lou Hamer, who many of you hold as a hero and many of us do right here in Mississippi. In fact, um, as, as I was thinking about today and reflecting on her three week trip to Africa, which took place in 64. And um, right after this Nick Freedom of Summer, or um, sorry, Summer of Freedom, I'm gonna get it together because this is my fourth Zoom call, so I'm gonna be real. Um, <laughs> that, um, that I was just sort of reflecting on the, the impact of Mississippi on the world and the impact of the world on Mississippi and how much um, we continue to learn from each other. And one of the things about the People's Advocacy Institute is that um, they're involved not only in being architects of abolition and creating a whole alternative system that engages many of the folks in Mississippi, including people who were um, formerly incarcerated, but also they help lead our People's Assembly work. And the People's Assemblies is part of our um, grassroots governance alternative. Um, we have influence in city government, but we're not the city government. We are the people's government. And People's Advocacy Institute supports staffs and holds down that work. So when you hear about People's Assemblies, you may not have heard of People's Advocacy Institute, but understand that they are the ones who hold that work down. And the other thing I just want to share about them and the work here um, that's important is that here in Jackson, we've always, in terms of movement folks, let me say, that we've always felt a real kinship and connection as part of our own global citizenship. So that's another reason why I'm super excited about this. Many um, organizers here travel, we have relationships with cooperatives in Spain and other places. Many people don't know that Mississippi is the site of some of the oldest cooperatives in the world, not just in the country, but in, in the world. I mean, there's some, of course, that are 500 years old and 600 years old that are also indigenous that are here as well. But um, we have more um, black co-owned electrical co-ops than any other place in the country. Um, and Mound Bayou, Mississippi, which is just down the road, was one of the first big experiments and um, cooperative governance. So I have to do that shout out before we um, go global um, for the home team. And so um, with all of that and all the gratitude and, and so grateful um, for, um, you know, for the work that everyone has done to make this possible to Haymarket Books, 
I want to start off by introducing who we have here, um, because you all already can see by the pictures that it's amazing folks. And uh, we're, I'm going to just sort of go in the order that people are going to say more about themselves, but just let you know a little bit more about them. So, um, and here we go. Uh, Medin Paulos is a filmmaker, researcher, musician, and an activist working for LGBTQ and citizenship rights in Italy. She's the director of the acclaimed documentary film Asmarina, um, the co-founder of the Milano chapter of Rete G2, the largest citizenship organization in Italy, and the creator of the G2 Lab. Her work with immigrant, refugee, and LGBTQ communities in Milan, Italy, is internationally recognized. So we welcome Medine. Um, Lorja Garcia Pena is a public-facing scholar, an activist, and the co-founder of Freedom University Georgia, a nonprofit organization that provides college instruction to undocumented students. She's the author of The Borders of Dominicanidad, Race, Nations, and Archives of Contradictions, and the co-director of Mind the Gap, Archives of Justice. Currently, she is an untenured associate professor at Harvard University. Um, Letty Volt is a law professor at UC Berkeley who has published multiple pieces on immigration and citizenship law with a particular focus on how law is shaped by ideas about culture and identity. She currently directs the campus-wide Center for Race and Gender. And last, but certainly not least, um, Angela Davis is a political activist, scholar, author, and speaker. She's an outspoken advocate for the oppressed and exploited and for all of us, all of us, all of us who have any sense, writing on black liberation, prison abolition, the intersections of race, gender, and class, and international solidarity with Palestine. She is the author of many books, including Women, Race, and Class, Freedom is a Constant Struggle, and Our Prisons Obsolete. She is the subject of the acclaimed documentary Free Angela and All Political Prisoners, and is Distinguished Professor Emerita at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And of course, uh, beloved in all of the ways um, for all of her work, struggle and brilliance as um, we are for all of the folks who are here. So we welcome you. So we're gonna start off with uh, Medine and then we'll um, go in the order that we talked about and give everybody a chance to sort of talk about themselves, their work. And, uh, and again, thank you all for joining. So, so my, my, hi everyone, it's really great to be here in conversation with all of you. I'm really honored I can begin to say how honored I am. I'm going to take the conversation outside of the U.S. and towards the Black Mediterranean, because that is where I'm from. As uh, the daughter of Eritrean immigrants born in Italy, a country that colonized Eritrea and other places in the Horn of Africa, and did not recognize me as a citizen when I was born, my commitment to abolition has been centered precisely around issues of citizenship and civic recognition for children of immigrants, immigrant rights, refugee safety, and the acknowledgement of colonialism as the root of all of this exclusion and violence. Unlike in the US where people um, born in the country become automatically citizens, in Italy, we have what's called youth sanguinis, or bloodline citizenship, which comes from both colonial and fascist legislations, aimed at regulating access to citizenship for mixed race offspring of Italian soldiers serving in the Horn of Africa in the early 20th century. What that means in the present moment is that someone like myself was born in Italy, foreign. That also means that the grandchild of an Italian immigrant in New York City who has never stepped foot in Italy, does not speak Italian or pay taxes, can, if they choose, to be Italian, where I am deemed to be foreign. So to be clear, this is a racist law. This reality is shared with many Italians of color 
who like me have immigrant parents who came from Africa, Latin America, Asia. And it's what has shaped my work both as an activist and as a filmmaker. With my film work, I try to historicize from the perspective of migrants, refugees, and second generation. Second generation is the political term we use in Italy to name kids of immigrants, born and or raised in Italy. So I try to historicize the experiences of colonialism and migration and diaspora. My activist work is somewhat multifaceted. First, I've worked for the past 15 years along organizers to abolish youth sanguinis and create a more inclusive citizenship legislation. Our actions have been educating the immigrant and second generation community about how to navigate the bureaucracy around immigration laws. If you're born in Italy to immigrant parents, the current law 91 of 1992 allows you to apply for citizenship when you turn 18. However, you have a window of one year to complete that process, to apply and complete that process. It is a cumbersome process and it's highly restrictive. It is also poorly publicized, meaning that people often miss out on that opportunity simply because they don't know they have that option. We work with schools, media and social media campaign, and we work extensively with Congress lobbying for change in citizenship law. The proposed legislation went up to vote, to a vote, and uh, was approved by the House of Representatives, but later on was rejected by the, by the Senate. So that means we're back to square one. My other main focus of activism has been around the safety and care of refugees arriving in Italy by boat via Libya. As we have seen in the news, for the past decade, Europe has been very concerned with the influx of people seeking asylum. Italy has become one of the main portals to Europe. The reality has, uh, their reality has contributed to the rise of the extreme right and increased racist acts aimed not only at newcomers, which would be bad enough, but also at those of us who do not have the right look. That means those of us who are not white. All the atrocities that we have seen from shooting at boats to letting people drown at sea uh, to racially targeted aggressions to the exploitation of migrant labor in the fields and factories to the sex trafficking of migrant women too many to count. And still, what happens in Italy to migrants, refugees of color, barely makes international news. So what we're trying to do is raise awareness to these issues by insisting in the fact that these are black lives too, and that they also matter. And that these injustices are historically grounded and perpetually repeated. So to me, it's no coincidence that the refugees coming to Italy are in large part coming from countries that were colonized by Italy and other European countries. Just like it's no coincidence to me that the asylum seekers at the US-Mexico border are coming from countries that the US invaded. The exploitation of migrants and the destruction of Black lives are global pro problems and they need to be addressed transnationally. So we're here to talk about this. My third area of commitment is LGBTQ plus migrant rights. And I am particularly concerned with the inter intersectional struggles of people who are migrants, second generation, refugees who are of color and also identify as LGBT. But this is something that will be the topic of my next film. So maybe we can talk more about later. So thank you for now.
Thank you so much. I appreciate that, Lord. You please go on. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a it's a great honor. Thank you so much. This has been um, a project that Angela and I have been talking about for a good part of this year, uh, uh, since early summer, and it's been uh, such a great honor to be in conversation with, with Letty, with Medine, and, and getting to know you, Makani. So wonderful to be here with you all today. Um, so I'm going to talk about my my work as a scholar and a teacher, which is which is what I think is my my contribution to this to this world at this moment. So I am as a public facing ethnic studies scholar and teacher who identifies as a migrant, a Latinx, and black. My small contribution to transnational struggles for justice at this moment in my life centers around abolishing the structures of the university and academia that subjugate knowledge, that subjugate the humanistic production and epistemology that comes from minoritized, colonized, racialized communities, such as the ones I come from as a black Korean immigrant. And I do this in my research by interrogating archives and paying attention to silences in the ways histories have been constructed in my teaching and mentoring by creating space both in and out of the classroom where anti-colonial communal knowledge making can be possible. And within and outside the institutions I work in by rebelling loudly and persistently against structures of the corporate university and the academy that veiled under the discourse of diversity and inclusion operate with impunity in reproducing exclusion, inequality, and violence against Black, Indigenous, people of color, and the knowledge that we produce. I mean, let's not forget that the university has functioned as a laboratory for white supremacy, fascism, and the experimentation on racialized bodies for centuries. It was at Harvard, for example, where the science supporting the production of Puerto Ricans as in an inferior race unworthy of US citizenship was manufactured in the early 20th century. And it is in the university, particularly in the elite private institutions, where most of our war leaders, including dictators, are formed. The power of the academy and the corporate university resides precisely on its exclusion and exclusivity, on ideas of superiority that are grounded on colonial legacies of white supremacy. Knowledge as imagined by the university is measured by its proximity to particular notions of civility that are grounded, as Lisa Lowe reminds us, on Eurocentric, colonial, and white supremacist views of the world. And yet the university continues to reproduce and value that scale, rejecting consciously the epistemology that comes from all other ways of knowing and the embodiment of that knowledge in students and teachers of color particularly those of us who come from working and migrant families who are first generation, those of us who own belong to the elite structures of the university. Now, I think all of us sitting in this imaginary table today share the understanding that education can be a critical tool for abolition. However, the education that we receive, that I myself received in all of our institutions from the moment that we begin 
kindergarten all the way through PhD is incomplete and is flawed. In schools as in the world, we're still experiencing the afterlife of slavery and colonialism. We're still dealing with the systemic violence against black people, with the exclusion of minoritized voices, with economic disparity, with environmental injustice. Schools are not immune to these ills. And what is worse, they reproduce it in their organizational structures, through their hiring practices, admissions, and in the syllabus and class programs that educate our children and youth. We have been socialized with notions of history and valuations of art, science, and literature that are biased, racialized, flawed, lacking. That is the way we have learned about human and social processes from revolutions to the birth of a nation, to feminist movements, to the artistic and literary trends, to even the way foreign languages are taught in our schools is through the lens of white supremacy. Then we have constitutions and legislations and institutions that become the source of entire nation's universal truths. Take my country, the Dominican Republic, for example. The partial lies that have been institutionalized through literature and history have led to extreme xenophobia against Haitians for over a century. The tangible truth, the tangible results of these learned lies is the loss of the loss of lives. It's, it's tangible violence and death of human beings. What we teach in schools has direct impact on how people understand themselves in relationship to those who are different from them. It shapes how we choose to border each other, to police each other and inflict violence. So what I'm interested in doing through my work is to bring attention to the systematic ways in which academia and institutions of learning participate in bordering, excluding, and silencing human beings through structures that are grounded on white supremacy. I try to insist on the importance of subjugated knowledge and of silences in helping us unlearn all that bullshit that we have been fed. Those silences are what we truly need to understand our human experience. And it is that knowledge and those silences that I'm committed to through my research and through my writing and through my teaching. And given the state of this nation and of our world, where we sit listening to presidential candidates debate who cannot talk about Latinx and black communities without reproducing the same violence on those communities, who cannot talk about racism and white supremacy without blushing or saying something completely ridiculous, these are college educated men and women, most of them I believe graduates. So I must insist that there is really no more urgent matter in our learning institutions than to abolish it, their own frameworks and to start over, begin again. But um, I digress. I have been asked to introduce my work, a task that I must admit I find quite difficult to do. I much rather introduce my brilliant colleagues here present. What I could say as a way to summarize the work I do is that I have two very simple goals. The first one is to abolish through my research, teaching and organizing the violent and toxic white supremacist frameworks of knowledge production that the university privileges and sustains by foregrounding instead subjugating knowledges, lives and people. And the second is simple is to build, support, and sustain multiple forms of transnational, intersectional communities of rebellion that build possibilities of what Jonathan Lear calls radical hoping through tangible and practical acts of solidarity and justice aimed at contrasting the violence and destruction many of us face every day with possibility and joy. It was these two goals that were at the center of many of the projects I've embarked through the years, including my participation in the creation of Freedom University, an organization that provides scholars instruction to undocumented students, and more recently in the creation of Mind the Gap Archives of Justice, a project that historicizes the contribution of women of color migrants in the United States and Europe to historical processes and events, as well as in my scholarship on borders, archives, diaspora, and global blackness. To me as a scholar, the work that we must do within our institutions of learning must also decidedly be within the framework of anti-coloniality, abolition, and transnational solidarity. That is the work to be done. That is where the transformation 
can be possible. So I'll stop here and look forward to hearing from Letty. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Letty, can, would you mind? You ready? Everybody ready? Oh, I'm so honored and moved to be here. Um, I'm coming to you from the territory of Hui Chin, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the sovereign Verona band of Alameda County. Um, I am so honored to be here speaking alongside Makani, Nadine, Lorja, and Angela. As Makani said, I work on immigration and citizenship, and in particular, on the way in which race and gender and ideas about identity and culture shape immigration law and citizenship law. One strand of this work looks at how presumptions about culture are deployed in immigration law to enforce and exacerbate gender subordination and racial subordination. So this work is deeply concerned with ways in which racism is used in the service of eradicating sexism so that claims about feminism serve as a proxy for xenophobia or Islamophobia. These claims rely on the presumption that certain communities or certain parts of the world or certain cultures or certain religions are more gender subordinating than others. As a recent example of this work, I've written about the way in which the Trump administration invoked the term honor killings in different iterations of what we know as the Muslim ban. The deliberate inclusion of this term allows Muslim immigrants to be simultaneously aligned with terrorism, gender subordination, and the threat to sexual liberty. This enables the administration to pretend to be concerned about gender or sexual equality while banning Muslims from entering the country. This work links to the abolitionist project in criticizing what has been termed carceral feminism, the calling for increased criminal enforcement, punishment, and imprisonment in response to gendered violence, which similarly relies upon racist structures and the violent, sa violent state in order to save women. I also write about immigration and citizenship as a topic of legal history and as a contemporary concern, writing, for example, about how post 9-11, we saw the consolidation of a new identity category of those who appear Arab, Muslim, or Middle Eastern, disidentified as citizens and identified as terrorists, um, or about the transnational movement of an image associated with immigrants, the running immigrants traffic sign of Southern California, which in the US context symbolizes illegal immigration and its movement to Germany, where in 2016, it appeared on signs and banners saying welcome refugees, later manipulated by anti-immigrant groups such as Pegida to say rape refugees, not welcome. In all of this work, what might be the unifying theme is how the nation narrates itself and patrols its borders in relationship to persons whose identity is considered in some way antithetical to the nation state. But I've also been working on the question of the relation of immigration and indigeneity, bringing together legal history and political theory to think through the relationship between a nation of immigrants and settler colonialism. How immigration law imagines away pre-existing indigenous populations through how it thinks about space, time, and membership. How immigration serves as an alibi to settler colonialism. And how this vision of a nation of immigrants elides all the ways in which the US creation of and manipulation of borders and bodies in the service of capital accumulation and territorial acquisition has been deeply violent. 
The nation of immigrants idea is one of individual immigrants making the choice to come to a welcoming United States, buttressing the notion of the United States as a political community created through consent of the governed. Dispossession, genocide, forced migration, enslavement, colonialism, imperialism, death, all disappear covered up by immigrants choosing America. This idea of a nation formed by immigrants voluntarily moving through space also naturalizes the formation of those borders. The national borders of the United States were drawn through pre-existing nations, turning indigenous peoples into immigrants, also erased as colonialism and conquest. Right? While immigration law imagines present day borders as fixed and people in motion, borders also move. As is said, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. So I'm speaking to you from what is both Ohlone territory and what was Northern Mexico. What is also naturalized is the idea that immigration starts and ends at the border, that it only needs to concern itself with the problem of managing the movement of those seeking to come, as opposed to thinking about, as we've heard from actually both Median and Lorgia already, why people are forced to leave their homes. As people say, we are here because you were there, or we are here because you are there, right? Immigration is about a deeply unjust world, and the focus needs to be on the role of the United States in creating instability and destruction in shaping why people move. I've devoted a lot of time over the past few years thinking about how Donald Trump mobilized tremendous support for his presidency through equating America first with white supremacy, that borders are to be used in the service of keeping out and kicking out Muslims, Mexicans, Central Americans, rapists, criminals, terrorists, animals, those who do not have what he referred to as good genes, who should go back to their filthy shithole countries. In this vision, the United States is innocent and vulnerable to penetration and needs the defense of the wall built in part by Israeli military contractors through Tano Odom land. But it is important to think about the ways in which Trump's verbal articulations only overlay the violence of borders. We see this violence with human caging, forced sterilizations of women in ICE detention, and countless people who have died trying to cross deserts and oceans. The violence of borders appears on the body. So I'm also interested in my work to think about the violence of liberal approaches to immigration. We can imagine with a new Biden administration that we might see something similar to an Obama administration, which relied for deportation priorities on the sorting of immigrants as good and bad, targeting felons, not families, as if people with felony convictions do not have families, and which explained the deterring of refugees from coming to the United States, not through Trumpian invocations of xenophobic racism, we don't want you, but through the language of humanitarianism. Don't try to travel here because it is too dangerous a journey. And in order to deter others from making that journey, we will put mothers and children together in family prisons. So I'm gonna end there and I look forward to hearing now from Angela. Thank you so much, Letty. Angela. very moved by all of the presentations thus far. So let me say, first of all, I am um, really happy to be a part of this event uh, organized by study and struggle. And I want to thank Lorja especially for inviting me. Um, and I really love the focus of this discussion, movement building and transnational freedom struggles because this is um, how I might characterize the context of my own work over the last 50 years or even longer. Um, and I'm thinking, I may begin with a story. Um, 
uh, about growing up in the South and imagining that uh, the North was the venue of freedom, that if I, if I only made it to the North, I would be free. Uh, turns out I went to high school in New York, uh, and I discovered what I recognize now as more complex forms of racism, more hidden forms of racism, uh, which I sensed then. Uh, and so I began to think um, about where freedom might be located in the world. And because I had uh, become really interested in French literature, um, I decided that France was the venue of freedom, uh, of liberté, égalité, fraternité, right? Uh, and so I, I traveled to France. Uh, and uh, one of the first things that happened to me on, on my very first trip to France uh, was that um, some women from Martinique warned me uh, that I might be mistaken as Algerian by the uh, French police. Uh, uh, and uh, that uh, generated an interest in what was happening in Algeria. And I eventually uh, participated in some of the demonstrations that were being organized on behalf of the Algerian revolution. Uh, and so later I realized that uh, uh, although I did not find freedom, I didn't find freedom in the North, I didn't find freedom in Europe, but I did find international solidarity. I found the Algerian revolution. Uh, and, uh, and that has remained with me. Uh, uh, I've been doing work that might be described as abolitionist since the 1970s. Uh, the uh, Attica uprising took place in 1971 uh, when I myself was uh, in, in jail and I, I uh, remember uh, uh, the call for abolition that came from the Attica brothers uh, struck me as uh, uh, explaining so much of what I had not been able to uh, explain or understand. Uh, uh, the historical process, for example, the connection between um, the putative abolition of slavery and uh, what uh, needed to happen with respect to uh, prisons. Um, I think I've always been interested in processes that um, emphasize and popularize historical consciousness. Uh, I studied um, French literature and I studied philosophy, but always in historical contexts. And I say that because I think historical co historical consciousness is what we lack in this country. There are white people who still think that because they or their immediate families were not directly involved in slavery, that they're completely exonerated, that they bear no responsibility. They have no idea what historical responsibility means. Uh, uh, capitalism, especially capitalist ideology in its neoliberal form benefits from this historical amnesia um, because the temporality that capitalism urges is a perpetual present. Uh, it's one of the reasons we find ourselves trying to address problems now that should have been addressed over 150 years ago. And it's also, it seems to me, why we end up calling for reforms over and over and over and over again. If one looks at the history of incarceration and the history of policing, one discovers that there have been calls for reforms throughout the histories of these institutions. As a matter of fact, the, the calls for reforms have constituted a central element of the history of these institutions. And as such, um, have become the glue that has that has held these institutions together. Uh, uh, and of course, um, even as these reforms have been instituted, both incarceration and policing have only grown more racist, more repressive, more violent. Uh, and this is why um, I was so struck by the call for 
evolution, um, the radical alternative. Uh, and when I say radical, I, I, I don't know how many times I've made this point. I, mean, I, 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 I sound like a broken record to myself uh, uh, that the etymological meaning of radical is root. And so abolition allows us to get at the root of the problem. It enables us to escape from being trapped by the same framework and the same footprint. So uh, we don't look at policing and incarceration as discrete institutions that must perpetually remain at the core of our attempts to make human community. Um, so I see abolition as a revolutionary perspective. I, it asks us to understand and resist not only the particular institution we're concerned with, and of course we're talking, we've, we've, we've talked about police and we've talked about prisons and Lorja has talked about uh, educational institutions and university, but it asks us to address all of the conditions and forces that enable the continued existence of the institution. So we won't simply add the adjective humane to the name of an institution that is so deeply flawed, so structurally racist, so profoundly influenced by heteropatriarchal ideologies um, that we would have to say, um, well, we know policing is racist, so let's struggle for a more humane racist policing. Uh, we know incarceration is inherently class bias, inherently violent, so let's struggle for a more humane uh, class bias, a more humane violence, a more humane wall, a more humane ice. Um, and so I, I, I've, I've come to the conclusion, both as a result of my scholarly work and my activist work, is that we um, enlarge, we have to enlarge our analytical framework if we want to avoid being trapped on this treadmill of reform. Um, we have to ask questions about connections and, and relations, relationalities. In other words, we have to do a feminist uh, analysis. We, we don't ask the question what can we do to make an institution that has already demonstrated that it can never fundamentally change? Uh, um, you know, how do we make that institution change? But rather we ask what are the, are the con contextual conditions and surrounding social forces that need to shift in order to ensure that we don't need to rely on these institutions in order um, to survive and in order to flourish. Uh, therefore, we need schools, not jails, but we don't need schools that, that try to become jails, which is what we have now. And, and I would say that this is, an, this is what we have come to call an intersectional approach. Uh, uh, and the part played by feminism, um, anti-racist, anti-capitalist feminism, is not only to ensure that we keep gender within our frame, but it is to ensure that our analysis is not lazy, that we don't shy away from complexity, that we realize that abolition involves both the negative process of overturning and disestablishing, but also, and more importantly, the reconstructive process of creating something new, not just one new thing, but addressing all of the enabling um, conditions. Um, so, um, so I guess I would I'll conclude by saying that, uh, and I, I, I did a um, webinar with Lenny not too long ago on abolition feminism uh, and you know the meaning of abolition feminism. I would end by saying that abolition needs feminism. It needs anti-racist, anti-capitalist feminism. Um, uh, but, Feminism needs abolition. Uh, you know, otherwise it becomes the kind of carceral feminism that Lenny was talking about. Uh, uh, and uh, I think that abolition has to be placed within an internationalist framework. Let's not only think about the US, but let's think about Brazil. Let's think about Palestine. Let's think about Europe. Let's think about 
um, Australia. Um, and with that, I think I'll conclude. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, and thank you, everyone. It's good to hear from each of you. I, I have a couple little questions. They're going to be a little different, I think, because from listening to everyone. And um, I, I've been reflecting a lot on the fact that this is the 65th anniversary of the Bandung Conference. And, um, and for, for many folks, a turning point in understanding of themselves as international um, you know, sort of um, not the birth, but certainly a, an important milestone in how many of us thought about how our um, movements were connected, all these kinds of things. And I also think about this question, and this makes me think about something you brought up, Lorja, in terms of these communities of rebellion, mm -hmm. these this um, idea of de sort of debordering, right, and and resisting. And and when I was listening to to Angela and, and actually all of you talk about the ways in which um, we are, we continue to replicate um, these oppressive models, even sometimes in the ways we organize, um, is people trying to translate, like what does it mean to, to organize from this place of freedom, from liberation? And so I was curious if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about how you see these communities of rebellion, like what does that look like? And and, and, and that sort of process of, of education or maybe uneducating, you know, or diseducating um, to disrupt all that. Like, what does that look like? You know, you, you hit the, the nail right in the head. I mean, the, the, the process requires a lot of unlearning. I think there's quite a bit of, um, quite a bit of mislearning that we have all uh, done and that we a lot of the work that we're doing all of us in this around this table but also a lot, a lot of the people watching is precisely try to unlearn um i think the for me i think the work is exactly how angela was describing it. it has to do with building and with being able to and willing and having the the the, the both the fortitude the amount of hoping that needs to happen. And, I'm, and when I say hoping, I'm not talking about your, you, you know, sitting with a rosary and praying, but rather believing that the kind of work that you are putting energy into is going to actually um, create effective changes because otherwise, the, what is the point of doing the work we're doing? Um, but I think for me, um, when it comes to learning, when it comes to creating communities that are, um, that are hopeful, that are, feminist um, interventions into uh, the world that we are choosing to create, not the one that we are inheriting it. It has everything to do with, with community and with transnational community, with sitting with each other together. I think for those of us who are scholars and who are trained as scholars, we've been trained that to believe that, especially if you're a, a woman of color, that they can only be one of us that they can only be one of us in the room, that they can only be one of us in the classroom, that they can only be one of us teaching this particular subject. And that is how we've been socialized and that is how the institutions operate and that is, this is how they maintain um, this, this exclusion, this violence, because it is both oppressive and, and isolating. And I think um, in, in the classroom with students, that is replicated in these ideas of we found something in the archive and therefore you own it and now you own history and that legitimates you. And I think that the, the work that I'm, that I'm hoping to do, the work that I'm trying to do with my students and with my colleagues is to think about learning as communal, think about learning as a process that can only happen if we all together put a little bit and think together. And it's so, we, we all know this, we all know that we learn from each other, this is why we're here as a group and this is not an individual lecture, because we know that we learn from each other and we learn from bouncing off ideas, but somehow our educational systems do not reward that. We reward the individual paper, we reward the individual book, we re reward the individual intervention and the words and the, and the whatnot. And I think that one of, one of the main goals that we should have as educators is to not only abolish that idea, but invite collaborations and invite unlikely collaborations um, of multiple people, because this is how we learn, but this is also how we can grow. 
um, this is also how this are a very practical ways in which we can build this kind of transnational communities that we're striving to build. We can't build those by staying in our own corners. We have to talk to each other. We have to find that space. And that space needs to also be practical. We have to think about things like childcare and caring for the elderly and so on. If we don't have those resources, if we don't have that as part of what we're doing, then we, we cannot move forward. It is, it is not not taking into account that we're dealing with humans. I'm sitting here with you all and my dad's in the hospital right now. So half of my head is thinking, how's my father doing? That is that is human process. And I think for all the work that we do, we have to acknowledge that we all come from multiplicities of experiences and responsibilities. And as as we build together, we have to take all of this into account. And that's, that's how we grow and that's how we build. And that's the kind of university I want to be part of, one that takes into account that maybe I'm going to need babysitter to teach and, and, and that maybe my students are going to need a meal in order to sit in the classroom. And all of these things seem to be part of the equation communally for all of us. Thank you for that. We're going to take a minute for the interpretation to change. <laughs> and then I'm, I'm coming to Medea and I have a question for you about storytelling. <laughs> yeah, we're we're off script right now. We're in it. So here we go. <laughs> John, you give me the high sign and we'll start and we'll start rocking. Got it. All right, so, and thank you so much for our interpreters. One, y'all are lit, so much beautiful energy. And two, we just appreciate this and appreciate the opportunity for as many people to be a part of this um, as possible and that you all are making it possible. So thank you. So Medine, you are a storyteller. You're a person who has um, used a lot of different media to to talk to people about these issues, you know, to take it outside, right, to where people are. So I'm curious, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about um, the importance of story and transforming and helping people to imagine a difference, but also to feel. Like I, I got a chance to watch your beautiful film, Asmarina, thank you for that. So, so beautiful. Um, and I also was sort of reflecting myself. It's like, when was the first time I imagined myself free? And it was really in reading a poem and, and watching a picture. And, you know, and, you know, that was sort of like the thing. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit about your process, how you see this contributing to how we think about abolition and freedom and liberation and, and on why you decided to embark on this as, as one of your tools. Thank you for this question. And also thank you for watching my film. I'm always appreciative of anybody who, who watches and listens. Um, my storytelling, I don't tend to call myself that because most of all, and first, of all, I, I consider myself to be a story listener. That's that's what I've done. I always joke, but not even so much that I, I started talking at 12. Before that, I just listened. And I I was raised in, a, in an environment and in a space, Europe, slash Italy, slash Milan, slash Eritrean Ethiopian community, uh, where all that was said about me or anybody like me was said by somebody that was nothing like me. And that came to me from all fronts uh, when it came for me to establish my identity as an Eritrean, when it came to me for, uh, for me to establish myself as a, a, a lesbian, uh, when it came to me to, to start speaking up and asking for our rights and and so I, I simply listen and I try to give back. 
what I think is important is uh, to, to switch the perspective. Uh, every, everything I read about colonialism, about any part of history uh, in school, in high school and, and, and university uh, was either uh, very poorly written or non-existent. So various parts of, my, of, of the puzzle that is me uh, were missing. The, the pieces were missing. And it's, it all, I, all, I always also had the, the, sense, the feeling that, okay, I am part of this community and I'm going to live and express myself in this space over here. And then I'm also part of this other community and I'm going to feel and express myself separated. But I'm a person. Uh, I'm, it's, I, 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 had, I had to find a way to, to, to fuse all of me into one. And I also am very, very interested in um, sh shedding light on what I, I tend to call the space in between. This space, because we are all a multiplicity of things and experiences and anything, you know, even things that are not visible and recognizable at first sight. You know, I'm, we're not just black women, we're so much more. But it's w when you're part of multiple communities, there's a sort of an exclusion that can happen. When you're a, a daughter of immigrant, in, in, you know, in Europe, anywhere in Europe, there's you, you really, the risk is that to be left out from one community and the other one. But there's so, there's, there, it exists a space that's in between that's already full of so many types of people from all backgrounds and experiences. And I, I've always tried to do that, whether uh, through folk music, uh, through film, through photography, uh, through activism, to put in connection people with, with themselves, but also with each other. And, um, you know, I consider myself a filmmaker, but I did photography and music for a long time as well. So I tend to, to, to follow the idea and then the media comes to me. I, I, I use the media. I use the media that, that's necessary to tell that specific story. It could be audio, completely audio, without images. Dep it really depends on what the story is. I give it the respect it deserves. Thank you for that. I'm glad I asked the question because I was curious. I don't know about everybody else. Um, Letty, I, I have a, a question for you. And I, as I was listening to you talk, and, and, and it doesn't matter how many times you hear the story, you are never desensitized to the horror and the just the just the the depth of all the the things that um, that this brings up um, and I know um, as someone who's spent some time at the US Mexico border as an observer and and things like that you just you just never ever get to the point where you're callous about that and I appreciate you telling these stories you also are a law professor, and you also think about policy, which is another way in which borders get created, right? Through the law, <laughs> right through, um, and um, and and so we have these these places of enforcement of terror and all these things, and like you were talking about, sort of the bloodless version, right? That um, through policy, I wanted to, to get you to talk a little bit more about that. Um, but but from an abolitionist perspective, so when you think about like, here's the way we understand law right now, right? <laughs> and then um, and then here's the way that we think about um, about law in this feminist abolitionist framework. Okay, unmuting myself. Um, that's such a fascinating question. 
um, how to think about law in a feminist abolitionist framework when essentially the law enacts violence, right? So can the tools be used, right, to deconstruct uh, the master's house is the question. So many people go to law school because they're really interested in trying to change society. And um, one of the things I think that's really frustrating is people realize that the way that how legal changes have been traditionally tried to, to be accomplished don't necessarily tackle systemic questions or utopian visions or what would really be the kinds of abolitionist reimaginings, right? So, I mean, essentially law is set up as a process either of band-aid, right, of trying to help individuals navigate a system and ensuring that this individual gets a particular benefit through providing these services, or it's trying to challenge policies and practices, but it's within the confines of what is set up as the law, right? And what the law is, is legislation that's created by some purportedly democratically elected body, right? Um, and we know all the ways in terms of voter disenfranchisement and gerrymandering and redistricting. And, you know, yesterday the Supreme Court heard oral arguments where Trump, the Trump administration is trying to take away undocumented immigrants from being counted as people for purposes of apportionment in the census, right? So um, I don't think it went very well for the administration, which is, which is good. But, but, but the, so that the, the way the system is set up is you have these purportedly representative bodies, which really are not representative bodies, right? which create these laws, and then you have a judiciary which is supposed to interpret them, and we know how the Trump administration has essentially packed the court with members of this group called the Federalist Society, right? We have the most reactionary judicial system in the United States that we've ever had, right? Maybe going back to what people refer to as the Lochner era, which was basically this era of pure economic rights. Um, and we have um, the executive, which enforces the laws, right? And here, in terms of the national scene, we have had this monster in office. Um, so it's very difficult to think about entering that path and trying to do something different. Um, what I think um, many people have done is to try to create alternative spaces and alternative ways of working, which are deeply holistic. They're community-driven um, where um, people say, I am a lawyer, I am a lawyer for the community, the community will help me figure out what it is that needs to be done. I will not identify myself as working on X issue because that particular issue might not be one that this community articulates as most important to them. Um, so the lawyer, in some sense, is um, serving uh, community organizing. Um, and where the legally trained person makes themselves available to try any kind of tactic, right? Whether it's um, filing something in a court or it's protesting with a sign or um, it's engaging in public shaming of uh, an official or, um, you know, it's, it's babysitting, right? So um, I'm reminded of um, work that, um, a dear friend, Julie Sue, who's now the labor commissioner for the state of California did, um, there was a large group of us who were representing um, about 70 um, people from Thailand who had been brought to the United States. They were working in a condition of indentured servitude, sewing garments for some of the nation's largest manufacturers and retailers. Um, and um, once they were liberated from this enslavement, um, basically Julie, who's an attorney, um, helped people buy shampoo, figured out this is how you use the public transit system to the extent it exists in Los Angeles. This is how you open a bank account, right? And these kinds of ways of dealing with people as people, as humans, right, that are very different from the traditional attorney-client relationship. Um, anyway, so I, I, 
I could go on, but I, I, I won't. And just say that there, there are a lot of really um, progressive, revolutionary um, uh, groups, oftentimes associated with the term rebellious lawyering or independent worker centers, which are doing this kind of work, uh, which are deeply important. Well, thank you for that. And, and also just want to acknowledge all of the folks who are out here thinking about this from an abolitionist framework who are coloring outside the lines. And um, and I know I wrote a book now 20 years ago, which is a textbook on community policy and just all the examples of when regular people get involved. So, and that turns me to Angela, who gets to close us out in a way. Um, and, and, and that is, you know, as, as, and, and, you know, we both have the same color hair, so you won't mind me saying veteran um, in, in the most beautiful way um, that, um, you know, so many people are, we're in this place where we are, it's easier, easier for us to connect, more organizers are t- traveling, and, um, and we're trying, and many, there's a lot of organizers watching this conversation. So I was wondering if, um, if you wouldn't mind sharing your thoughts about what is it that we should be thinking about now in terms of building this feminist, abolitionist, transnational, um, anti-capital, like all these things, this this intersection. um, Like what are some of the lessons that organizers should be reflecting on now as we're trying to build this work out? Okay, make sure you're not, uh, unmute yourself, because we want to hear this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks for reminding me. Uh, I always forget to unmute. <laughs> um, well, you know, first of all, this is really an exciting moment. And, uh, you know, as much pain and suffering as we are collectively experiencing in the world as a result of the pandemic and uh, the disparate impact on communities of color, poor communities. Uh, this is a revolutionary moment. Uh, and um, and I'm, really, I'm really happy as a veteran uh, to be able to witness it, to be able to recognize that the work that that uh, we may have done 50 years ago really has made a difference. Um, And uh, Letty, I was uh, thinking about the fact that uh, you were talking about um, um, revolutionary lawyering and I I was just on a call the other day with the Abolitionist Law Center. And and the fact that we have such a thing that is called the Abolitionist Law Center that is directed by an amazing uh, man, um, uh, Robert Salim Holbrook, who spent, I don't know, 25 years in prison. Uh, um, We're recognizing that a lot of the knowledge that has been really important and and helpful during this period comes from unlikely places. Uh, uh, You know, we tend to forget that, that, particularly in the context of mass incarceration, uh, the uh, prison has been the venue for some of the most um, interesting um, uh, uh, ideas and 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 uh, knowledge that has been produced uh, by people who have been in prison, you know, sometimes for um, I don't know, 40, 50 years. I was just watching a film the other day. Uh, called Since I've Been Down, uh, which is an incredible film about uh, the ways in which um, prisoners in this prison in Washington um, created created the kind of university, Lordia, that I think you would be interested in uh, uh, because uh, and the kind of storytelling that you would be interested in, Medine, uh, uh, because they weren't allowed to have... Um, have a university produce courses for them. They decided that they would learn how to create a curriculum. 
and they would learn how to teach. And it's the most amazing thing. Um, one of the one of the uh, uh, young one of the men said, um, "When I'm teaching, I almost feel free." And that that. That, that, that comment has just haunted me since I, I saw uh, the film. Um, yeah, so I think that uh, we're, we're seeing um, developments and processes that we could never have really imagined. Uh, uh, years ago when we, we were talking about you know, how to popularize abolition, it would have been impossible to predict that at one point there would be huge, massive demonstrations at a time of a global pandemic when people are counseled to stay yeah. inside. Uh, but um, no, they went out and protested against um, racism at their own peril, um, using slogans like defund the police. Uh, um, so I would, I guess I would say, um, uh, there's so much I want to say, but... Uh, I think that I'm going to go back to the internationalist framing of this conversation and how important it is to um, create ties and recognize that the U.S. is not the only place where important work is happening. Uh, you know, even even those of us who are opposed to the um, systemic structures of racism, governments, and so forth, we sometimes forget that we have not extricated ourselves from this sense that the U.S. is the center of the world. And we therefore don't look towards other parts of the world for inspiration, for knowledge. Um, racist police crimes uh, probably the country that has that has experienced uh, more racist police um, violence than any other country is Brazil. Uh, or we can even look at Nigeria and the, the struggles that are unfolding against the, um, what is it called, the uh, special anti-robbery squad, SARS, uh, struggles in South Africa. Um, I, I, a young, a young man, a young boy, 16-year-old, by the name of Nathan Julius, was, who had Down syndrome, was killed by the police in Soweto uh, not long ago. And, and so they're dealing with structural racism, even though all of the actors are black, even though the police are black. They're still dealing with a system uh, that, uh, was created during the apartheid regime, but retains the structural elements of, of racism, even though all of the actors are black. Uh, and this is something that we should definitely learn from in this country, because there's still those people who say, well, we need more black police, right? Um, you know, we need more black people here or there, and then things will automatically get better. But that's what we know that that diversity Diversity doesn't fundamentally change the structures. Um, yet, yet, uh, almost well, the 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 um, almost all of the major institutions now have their diversity. Uh, what is it called? Diversity, uh, uh, inclusion, and what is the other one? Well, anyway. Um, if the structure remains the same, it's going to continue to do the uh, the, the the violent and, and and racist work it did before. Um, so yeah, uh, I I I I think that uh, uh, we should um, we should really emphasize the internationalist dimension of our work. I'm uh, glad, uh, Makani, you mentioned. Um, uh, 1955 uh, and Bandung, right? Uh, you mentioned the anniversary of, of Bandung. I think it's important to be inspired by these efforts in the past to uh, create uh, um, um, uh, to create um, international uh, solidarity, but not only international solidarity. And I think I'll end with this, since we're since we've been talking so much about abolition, and we're also talking about borders. Uh, 
I think this is the time when we begin to imagine a, 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 a planet where the nation state does not constitute the primary form of human community, uh, 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 that uh, uh, we can imagine ourselves as global citizens, uh, we can imagine a world without borders. Uh, uh, and if we, if we imagine what we want, what we think we need, and then, you know, one day um, there's the possibility that it will be uh, um, an important ag a part of an agenda for change. Nobody ever imagined that abolition would help constitute agendas for change in our lifetimes. Uh, and I think that uh, the, 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 um, the work that is being done in um, Mississippi, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm so happy to be a part of this uh, study and struggle uh, uh, conversation. We need knowledge, we need struggle. Uh, that um, that uh, these are the formations that will uh, not only allow us to imagine a different future, but encourage us to do the work now that will definitely lead to change uh, tomorrow, whenever tomorrow comes. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. I do want to check in. We're going to do, we have seven more minutes, but we're going to do a s interpreter switch. Let them catch up. And um, all right, we're all set. And um, that question just, and, and so we had one question that hasn't been answered. And so this will be a lightning round um, of um, books or resources that folks would recommend um, that they check out in their journey to um, be radical, free, revolutionary, abolitionist, dot, 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 transformative um, folk. Mm. Um, what, what you got, fam, that you'd like, like to share with people that you think they, and we want to do we want to say yeah watch the film Asmarina, please that yes. that's a good one we have um, a Lorge's book which I, we mentioned and that's in the bio we have uh, lots of books by Angela um, but I want to give folks an opportunity to share any other resources that they think are important for folks to to have can I mention uh, another book by Angela yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> This is the forthcoming abolition period, feminism period, now period, from Angela Davis, Gina Dent, Erica Miners, and Beth Ritchie. Yes, yes. What a what a what a all star lineup. Look at that too. Yes. Say the name one more time, Letty. It's abolition period, feminism period, now period. Thank you. Yeah, we're desperately trying to finish it. <laughs> <laughs> but we know it's forthcoming and we'll be anxiously, anxiously awaiting it. Yes. Also, Haymarket is publishing it. So, hey, all the all the more talk about because we're talking about a free publishing company, not not um, one that's caught up in the corporate yes. um, trappings, but a nonprofit um, committed to the movement. We love Haymarket. Um, any other resources that folks want to share? I think for those of us who are teaching or in whatever spaces that we're teaching in, whether it's in the university or outside the the the, no, the, the institutions of learning, um, this book, In Subordinate Spaces by Barbara Tollinson and George Lipsis, has been um, a good accompaniment um, for me. Um, and I, I highly recommend it when you're, if you're trying to create a learning experience that's communal um, and that it's uh, in the spirit of the kind of conversation that we've been having. Thank you for that. Medine, do you have anything you'd like to share in that tip? 
Uh, I have many. The first one that comes to mind is Black Italians by an Italian writer. Uh, his name is Mauro Valeri. Or another one is from another professor, your colleague. Uh, her name is Gaia Giuliani, Il Colore della Nazione, or I'm sure she's online, Ijaba Shego, uh, Pecore Nere. There's so much, so much literature. These are just some. Okay, I have, uh, let's see. Um, this is a book um, called Decarcerating Disability. And it's by um, Liat Bimoshi. It's an amazing book that uh, um, addresses the ways in which uh, uh, the disabled community has struggled against, and sometimes successfully, against incarceration. And how uh, historically the incarceration of disabled people has prefigured and helped to create the conditions for mass incarceration. Uh, uh, it's a great book. Uh, and then another one that I, I, I just recently read by Adrienne Marie Brown. Do you all know her? Yes, we do. Okay, and it's Emergent Strategies. Uh, and I've done a, a couple of calls with her that were absolutely amazing. I think... Uh, uh, she's she's also interested in turning activism into uh, something that's pleasurable, uh, so that we don't have to think about uh, uh, activism as this, you know, always really um, heavy uh, uh, um, kind of process uh, where we don't have fun, where we don't experience pleasure or joy. So, um, Adrian Murray Brown. <laughs> Well, I love that, and I love the fact that so many of our loved ones got got put up and quoted in this in this lightning round of resources. Um, thank you for that, and I know um, Am would be thrilled. Um, and then we're also we also have this a wonderful one of the legacies of abolition in our movement is more attention to joy. People talking about joy in the work. Um, people talking about, you know, you know, dancing and singing. In fact, um, Adrian Marie Brown and I will facilitate one of the ways when people would make decisions is we would have a, a dance <laughs> for each decision. So it's um, I love the fact that all of that, and that's part of the legacy of abolition, um, because we're trying to break out and, and rethink our bodies in meetings, our our brains, our thoughts, our engagement. So I want to thank each and every one of you um, for this. You know, we thought 90 minutes was a long time, but it's not. We're, we're, we're here at the the end. Um, some of the titles are coming up. Thank you for posting them. We'll also make sure folks get copies of it. I would be uh, remiss as the co-chair of the Highlander board not to talk about Highlander is also a resource um, for <laughs> decolonizing education. Um, and also just grateful to everyone who joined us, grateful to Haymarket Books for always making this space in our brains and our hearts and, and online to have these conversations. Again, um, shout out to People's Advocacy Institute um, who um, will receive donations. Thank you to all who donated. And, um, and thank you to our interpreters and all of the wonderful folks who put this together together, um, including John and other folks on the team. Um, and with that, unless I hear anything else, I think we're about to close. Yes. Oh, yes. Shout out to Chandra Talpati Mohanty. Yes. All the homies are getting shout outs today. We're very excited about that. Very excited about that. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Makani, for getting us all together and organized today. It's lovely to meet you. It's awesome. And I actually, you guys pulled this together, Lorja and um, Charlotte and all the wonderful people who put this together. And I'm going to stop recording.